Our Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father, we thank you for this day that you have set apart. You sanctified and blessed it. You have given it to your people as a time to, to cease and desist from all the, the cares and the labors of this life to exclusively dedicate our energy, focus, time, attention, reverence, adoration to you and to you alone. May everything that is done here today May everything be pleasing in your sight. Let every word that is spoken, every song that is sung, every flag that is waved, let it honor you. And may the name of Yeshua, our Messiah and King, be lifted up that he may draw all men unto himself. And let the truth of your word, let the truth of your word go forth today into this room, let it resonate from this room into this community throughout this region and through the internet all over the world that the truth of the God of Israel would ring and outweigh anything that is being said in this day and time. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. So I have been asked today to share um, or to, to investigate, I, I guess, maybe that's the word I'll use to start out, where is Palestine? So I'm going to address that now. And we're going to begin in Psalm chapter 2, a very familiar portion of Scripture. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, literally against his Messiah, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So I want to suggest to you that among other things, these verses are describing a world that is opposed, first and foremost, to the sovereignty of the God of Israel. They do not want his bonds. They do not want any cords to restrain their penchant for lawlessness and doing whatever they will. It describes a world that is resistant to the reign of the Messiah because they conspire against the Lord and against his anointed, it says. But if they are setting themselves against the God of Israel, against the Messiah of Israel, it only stands to reason that they would set themselves against the people called Israel. And so this kind of summarizes what we see going on in our world today. A world that wants to embrace lawlessness, wants to throw off every kind of restraint that we see given to us through the scripture. They want to deny God's authority. They want to, if, could, if they could, undermine the kingship of the Messiah, and so they're taking it out on a people and a nation called Israel. And so this describes the attitude of those who loathe the notion of Zionism. And by Zionism, I mean the biblical definition of Zionism. I'm gonna give you a few passages to kind of make my point. Psalm 69, beginning verse 34. Let the, hurt, let the heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Psalm 102 verse 13. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. By the way, how many of you believe that we're living in that day? All right. Yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. And I just want to quickly interject a thought. Every time we've taken a group to Israel, there's always those two or three people that come back with a suitcase full of rocks. Thus fulfilling, your servants take pleasure in her stones. <laughs> so the nations shall fear the name of the Lord 
and all the kings of the earth, those same kings who set themselves against the Lord, against his Messiah, against his people, the kings of the earth shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion and he shall appear in his glory. Isaiah chapter two, verse three and four. In that day, many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. So there are many, many, many other scriptures that we could read that speak in concert with this theme, this idea that the Lord is indeed going to restore Zion. He is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. That's one of the last questions the disciples had for Yeshua before he ascended into heaven. Will you at this time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? And he said, basically, that's not for you to worry about at this moment. But the implication is there is a set time for, for that to occur. And I do believe that we are living in that set time. And so again, there are many, many other scriptures that speak of the restoration of Zion, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel under the authority of King Messiah Yeshua, who, as we just read, will govern the nations according to the Torah and will, as David prophesied in Psalm 2, will break the nations with a rod of iron. He will dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. And so, understanding that, I want to submit to you that this is why the nations rage. This is why the people plot a vain thing. Because the adversary knows that the Lord has declared, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. It is a done deal. It's going to happen. And all the nations and all of the adversaries of Israel can do, all they can do is rant and chant and march and protest. Yeah, they can make war, but all they're doing is plotting something or against something that is inevitable. He will He'll break them with a rod of iron. He'll dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And knowing that, they rage and they plot. This is why, I'm convinced anyway, this is why people across the world are marching in protest against Israel and chanting, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. And so they chant this as if there has been a sovereign nation called Palestine as if there's been some nation called Palestine that has a functioning government, uh, it's an established nation, globally recognized society that is exclusively Palestinian with its own institutions, with its industries, etc. And they chant these things as if this nation has suddenly been invaded by hostile uh, opponents and outsiders who moved in and then conquered them and and now these people who were once a nation are being forced to live under the boot heel of some foreign oppressor, a.k.a. Israel. So let me be clear on this, where I stand. That notion is pure fantasy. That Palestine does not exist. It never has existed. According to scripture, it may never exist. Ironically, the word Palestine or Palestinian originates from the name given to a people who were foreign to the land of Canaan, who actually did come from the outside and did invade the land of Canaan, conquered and dispossessed people who were native to that land a long time ago. You can read that in your Bible. So I say ironically because today, those who align themselves with Palestine and the Palestinians accuse Israel of being that foreign outsider coming in and invading, conquering, and dispossessing. And so I, I just find it ironic that the very name Palestine is related to people who actually did that. Those people are known to us as Philistines. They were generally believed to be a seafaring people with Greek origins. Some people identify them with Crete, the island 
The Bible connects them to a place called Kaftor. So we're gonna go into the Bible and a little bit of history. I hope that's okay, I'm gonna do it anyway. Because I still have 30 minutes. <laughs> the Bible connects them to a place called Kaftor. And in Jeremiah 47 verse four, this is what it says. The Lord shall plunder the Philistines, the remnant of Kaftor. That's what the Bible says. In another prophecy, in Zephaniah chapter two, this also predicts the demise of the Philistines, these ancient people. And in Zephaniah two, God referred to them as the remnant or the nation of the Herathites. The Bible has a lot of ites, but when you look at it in Hebrew, it doesn't say Herathites, it says Kriti, as in Crete. So there's some fanatic evidence that maybe they were related or you know, originated from the island of Crete or in that region. And there's a lot of other ver verses in the Bible that allude to their origins. But here's my point. Those verses of scripture confirmed that these people that we know as the Philistines were not native to the land. They were outsiders who came in, made war, conquered, dispossessed other people. That's who the Philistines were. The Bible first mentions them in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 14, and they are identified as descendants of Ham or Ham. Ham doesn't seem to be the right way to pronounce that on a day like today. Uh, <laughs> but actually, it's pronounced Ham, and Ham is a Hebrew word that means to heat up, to be hot. And from that word, we get this word, Hamas. And so these people, according to the Bible, were descended from Ham through Cush and through Mitzrayim. And it says in verse 14 that Mitzrayim begot Kasluchim, from whom came the Philistines and the Kaftorim. The Hebrew word here in Genesis 10 that is translated Philistine is Peleshet. And Peleshet means immigrant. So I'm trying to paint a little picture for you that the word Palestine, Palestinian, historically is tied to a group of people who actually were immigrants, outsiders, invaders, conquerors, and caused others to be dispossessed. And that is the point. The, the people who gave rise to the term Palestine, Palestinian, were those foreign invaders who were living on the Canaanite seacoast. That's, you can see that in Deuteronomy chapter two, verse 23. So is it not interesting, maybe even a bit ironic, that in today's world, Palestine is associated with those who claim to be the oppressed, when the very name is connected to people who were, in antiquity, the oppressors. But it's not only ironic, to me, it's typical of how a false accuser works. By the way, that word in Hebrew, that phrase in Hebrew, Ed Hamas, a false witness. That's how a false witness typically works. Someone who is an accuser, you know, the accuser of the brethren. The adversary is very good at making baseless accusation. And it seems to me that the accuser who is a false witness almost always accuses someone who is innocent of what he, the false accuser, is guilty of. How many of you have found that to be true in your life? Okay, I'm gonna to recommend to you that that is ongoing in the world today. I also wanna point out here that the Bible typically associates Gaza, Gaza, primarily with the Philistines. And that from the beginning, Gaza has been a source of conflict in regard to Israel. In other words, the Philistines, Palestine, along with Gaza and, and the people who lived along the seacoast there have, has almost always represented antagonism toward Israel. More specifically, it's almost always represented the opposition that comes from the nations, opposition to the biblical mandate given to Israel to possess the land. I want you to think about that for just a second. Make sure you heard me, make sure you understand what I'm saying that this name and this region that's being contested right now has almost always represented the world and the nation's opposition to the mandate that God has given to Israel to possess the land. 
Having said that, those who today identify as Palestinians are not descended from Philistines. As I understand it, the remaining Philistines who were living, living in Gaza and, and, and the five cities there along the seacoast, when Nebuchadnezzar came into Judea and destroyed Jerusalem and took Judah captivity, he also took the people who lived along the seacoast, those Philistines, into captivity. And that is where they apparently disappeared into history because there is no record that they returned to the land of Canaan. So, to make the point, it's not likely that modern Palestinians are related to ancient Philistines. As far as I know, they don't even make that claim today. There may be some do, but I, I don't think it's, it's uh, pervasive among them. More than likely, they're related to ancient Canaanites, and there's probably an infusion of those who lived in Arab lands who came into that region. So if they're not related to the Philistines, then why are we talking about the Philistines? Because again, that is where the term Palestine Palestinian originates from. And though they are not, the modern people who identify as Palestinians are not genetically related to the Philistines, at least as far as we can tell, I'm going to argue that they have come to represent in today's world what the ancient Philistines were to ancient Israel. And what is that? Opposition to God's purpose for Israel. Opposition to the biblical mandate given to Israel to possess the land that God deeded to Abraham and then Isaac and to Jacob and to their descendants. That's what they've come to represent. That's what that term has come to represent. So how did the land come to be known as Palestine in the first place? Even, you know, especially since the Philistines apparently disappeared into history. A very, very brief very abbreviated history lesson. The Greeks dubbed it Philistia. And you can find that word in the Bible, by the way. The Greeks dubbed it Philistia, and here is Bill's opinion. Why would they call it that? Because, well, if Greek people or people related to the Greeks from Crete had settled into that area and they're kind of cousins and all this, why wouldn't they call it Philistia over Israel? Because the Greeks aren't motivated to endorse and support the purposes of the God of Israel. The Greeks and their culture stands, you know, generally speaking, opposed to everything we see presented to us in Scripture and, and, and what God calls his people to do. And if that were not so, we would not have this celebration we call Hanukkah, right? Because that world, that Greek world, was in opposition to the Hebrew-speaking world. My point again, why would the Greeks call it Philistia? Well, why would they call it Israel? Why wouldn't they call it Philistia in favor of people that they were related to who had settled there? And then, of course, the Romans came behind the Greeks and they borrowed from the Greeks and they call it Palestina. And it seems to me, and I think a lot of other people, that the Romans did this primarily in an effort to erase Jewish identity from the land. They did the same thing with the city of Jerusalem. They renamed it and made it a Roman city. Why? To erase the fact that there was a people that God had called and placed there to give them that land, to be in their midst, they wanted to erase all of that from the face of the earth. And then, of course, after the Romans, other nations followed suit. And so that name that was given to it, Philistia, Palestina, it was retained th through the ages all the way up to the British Mandate. And so then as a result, people who lived in the land under the British mandate were sometimes called Palestinian. But because they were residents of the British mandated Palestine, not because they were from a nation called Palestine. All this began to change in 1948, of course, when Israel was reborn as a nation. So history bears out that claiming to be a Palestinian, as it is currently used, didn't really come into vogue until somewhere in the mid to late 1960s. And I have an opinion as to why that may have happened. Because there were people living in the land that thought they would force the Jews back into the sea and chase them out of the land. And in June of 1967, they found out that wasn't gonna happen. They found out 
that we're not going to be able to beat these people with conventional arms. So they took up another strategy. Because remember in Psalm 2, what do the kings of the earth do? They set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. They plot and scheme. A vain thing, it says. So they had to get crafty. So my view is, probably as a result of the Six-Day War, this is when it became acceptable to start identifying as a Palestinian, more so than in times past. And that's the PLO kind of uh, pushed this effort. And it was used, and this is my point, it was used as a political maneuver. It wasn't so much that, I'm not convinced anyways, it wasn't so much that they were proud of their Palestinian past, because again, remember, there has never been a place, a nation, a sovereign nation with a functioning government called Palestine. That's the name that the nations gave to that land. And so my point is the term Palestinian was weaponized in order to delegitimize Israel. It's important for us to remember the nations are opposed to the God of Israel and they are opposed to his purpose. The nations at large never have had and they continue to have no interest in preserving the name Israel. In other words, it suits the agenda of the nations to identify the land as Palestine. Again, the kings of the earth, they set themselves against the Lord and against his Messiah. They plot and they scheme. They say, let us break their bonds. We don't want his we reject his sovereignty. We don't want his rules. We don't want what he has determined. We want to do what we want to do. Let us cast away their cords from us. Let, we don't want to be restrained by what the Lord has said. And so then, in short, the whole notion of Palestine is an attempt to whitewash. It's an attempt to erase. It's an attempt to eradicate the nation and the people that God calls Israel, Because remember, this wasn't a name that Jacob took upon himself to identify with. This is a name and a call that the sovereign of the universe bestowed upon this man named Jacob. And so again, this whole notion of Palestine and free Palestine, Palestine, will be, it's, it's a fantasy. It's a fantasy in the minds of those who oppose the God of Israel to erase and eradicate the people that God calls Israel. In this day and time, it seems to be very popular to try to erase history. Tearing down monuments and pretending that this never happened, calling it something else, identifying as something that does not exist, I mean, everybody in here and everybody out there, hopefully you realize that God, when he created mankind, he created them male and female, right? Two. Not multiples, right? And yet we live in such a crazy world that people are just all over the place identifying as things that do not exist. Can I suggest to you that the same principle can be applied to our topic. People identifying as something that really doesn't exist. It's very common today. And so there is this effort and has been for millennia now, but it's, it's, you know, it's gaining intensity right now. There is this move to remove Israel from history to resist God's purpose. And I would recommend to you all of that, to erase Israel, eradicate Israel, to resist God and his Messiah. All of that is summed up in the word Palestine because of what it represents. And that's, again, why these, these proponents of a free Palestine and those who align themselves with Hamas, Hezbollah, people in this nation, people... <laughs> And they go around chanting from the river to the sea. That is a cry to eradicate Israel, which now brings us to this thought. Psalm 83, verse one. Do not keep silent, O God, 
and do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God, for behold, your enemies make a tumult or an uproar. That word actually means growling, raging. Those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people. By the way, crafty, same word that describes the serpent in Genesis chapter three. Subtle. Crafty, clever, sneaky, slick. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your treasured ones or your sheltered ones. Some translations say hidden ones. But here's what I want to emphasize. These people who are doing this have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. That is the agenda, that the name Israel may be remembered no more, that it might be wiped off the face of the earth to to disappear into history, much like what happened with the Philistines of long ago. And yet that name and and the role they play where ancient Israel is concerned has been resurrected, as it were. But they want to erase the name of Israel. They want to do away with that, that it may be remembered no more. This is the adversary's agenda. This is the adversary's agenda. And so consequently, it is the agenda of those who will listen not to the voice of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but will listen to that other voice. Who will listen to that voice who was whispering in that tree, didn't God say this? Don't listen to what God has to say. Listen to what I have to say. It's the same kind of lie. And so it is the agenda of the adversary and of the nations of the earth, according to scripture, to blot out the name Israel, which then begs the question, what's in the name Israel? It's a call. It's a call to be upright, yashar, before God. To walk straight. To be a people that go against the grain of what the world thinks and says and does. The name Israel embodies the call to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, his own special treasure. So that as Peter said, that we would show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, that we would be that city upon a hill that cannot be hidden, should not be hidden, and should not be silent, should not cower in a corner somewhere just because people are marching down the street and chanting all these ridiculous things. If anything else, it should be a call for us to stand up and shout. We're not going to listen. We're not going to support this lie. The name Israel embodies what the kingdom of heaven is all about. To be that light in the midst of darkness. And to know that the kingdom of heaven is at war with the kingdom of darkness And if you're in a war, the idea is not to circle the wagons and wait till Jesus comes. The idea of war is to advance against the adversary, taking territory away from the kingdom of darkness so that those who are in captivity can be liberated, so that those who are in bondage can truly be set free. And not not even the gates of hell, Messiah says, will be able to prevail against the people who are standing on the truth that he is the Messiah of Israel. He is the son of the living God. And he is returning to take up his throne in Jerusalem. All right, so I may have strayed a little bit from the original topic. So where is Palestine? Palestine exists in the minds of politicians who are woefully ignorant of the scripture. Palestine exists in the secret chambers of those who seek Israel's destruction. Palestine exists in the fantasies of those who are arrogantly opposed to God's purpose and his will. There is no country called Palestine. There is no kingdom called Palestine. There is no empire called Palestine. There is no president of Palestine. There's no prime minister of Palestine. There is no king of Palestine. 
because there has never been and is not currently a sovereign nation by that name. It is an idea, an idea that was hatched in the minds of people who opposed the will and purpose of God, especially as it relates to his people called Israel. Yeah, I know that there's this thing called the Palestinian state, and there's a lot of nations who have recognized this Palestinian state. But if you look at a map of the nations who have done this, most of them are Islamic nations or nations run by despots and tyrants. Most of them. In other words, I would say that most of those nations are predisposed to oppose the will and the purpose of Israel's God. And so just because there's a lot of nations who are recognizing it doesn't mean it is. Just because there are a lot of people who are saying that this person who was born a male has chosen to identify as something that doesn't exist doesn't make it so. Maybe it's time, go ahead, go ahead. Maybe it's time for somebody to say, the emperor hadn't gotten anything on. He's walking around in his underwear, right? <laughs> All right, I'm almost done. There are no prophecies in which God promises to redeem and to restore Palestine. Done. To the contrary, Philistia, along with Edom, you know, that's Esau, Ishmael, Amalek, many others. Philistia is listed as an enemy of God in Psalm 83. In Exodus 15, he says, sorrow will take hold of Philistia, Edom will be dismayed. Psalm 108, verse nine, over Edom I will cast my shoe, over Philistia I will triumph. There are no promises to bring back the dispersed of Palestine. No promises of a future Palestinian prince of peace who will rule the world from Jerusalem. All those promises are made to Israel. So, so all you who are here and all you who are watching, all of those who will be watching later on, I'm gonna submit to you to refer to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, as Palestine, as far as I'm concerned, it is equivalent to ignoring God's sovereignty. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He deeds it to whom he pleases. And so to call the land of Israel by a name that it is not is to ignore his sovereignty. In short, it is rebellion against his will. It is to align ourselves with the likes of Esau, who, by the way, tried to re redefine Israel as a cheater, as a supplanter, as somebody who takes something that isn't his. But it was never Esau's in the first place. It, it always belonged to Jacob. <laughs> I don't have time to develop this, but according to the Bible, and this is specifically um, in Ezekiel, those who claim the land as their own and saying that it doesn't belong to Israel, according to the prophet Ezekiel or the Lord through the prophet, prophet Ezekiel, the people who are making that claim are remnant of the nations and all of Edom, Esau. Now, I, I wanna say this because I know that some people you know, could hear what I'm saying and, and misconstrue my intent. I wanna say that there are many people who identify as Palestinian who are genuinely nice people. I've been in their homes, they've, they've fed me. You know, they've, they've, they've been very kind to me. And some of those people, all they wanna do is they wanna make a living and they wanna raise a family in peace. So I, don't, I, I wanna be clear that we're not against all Palestinian people. That's, that's not the message here. I have to be fair, I've met some Jewish folks who aren't really that nice. That's true. No, present company excluded. 
But my point here is we don't hate Palestinian people or people who identify as being Palestinian. No, we pray for them because the Messiah died for them too, right? But it, yes, go ahead. But if we're going to be a light to them, we have to represent what is true to them. And so this is not an issue of preferring one ethnicity over another. It's, it's not an issue that we prefer a nationality over another. It's, it's not preferring those who are, lean more toward a democratic form of government over those who lean more toward authoritarian, uh, authoritarian views. It's, it's not really about that. It's about right and wrong as God defines it. It's about thus says the Lord. It's about being on God's side in the matter, regardless of the politics of the day and regardless of the trends of society and what's popular. It's about standing up for what God says is his will. And so when Moses came down from the mountain and all this craziness was going on, he said, whoever is on the Lord's side, let him come to me. And that's what's important here, that we understand what the Lord's purpose and will is and we line up with his purpose and will. And so then where is Palestine? There is no nation called Palestine. There never has been. It's a name that has been adopted by the nations to erase the nation that God established upon the land. And so then, that is why I stand with Israel. Because I choose to be on the Lord's side. I choose to follow the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because I stand with Israel, I'm not going to ignore what God has ordained just because it's politically expedient. I share with the congregation a lot this idea that if we are compelled to make a choice between offending a person, man, and offending God, we'll offend that person every time because none of us want to stand before the creator of the universe and have offended him throughout our lifetime. Better to be ostracized by the entire world, but to know that we're standing with the truth because we're standing according to the purpose and will of God. Because I wanna hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with this. I'm, I've never been a poet I'm no Robert Frost for sure. But listening to the enemies of Israel chanting, you know, they're from the river to the sea thing, prompted me to reciprocate. So here it is. From the river to the sea, Israel the nation shall always be. Her king from Zion shall surely roar. Her foes, though many, will rise no more. For now they march in angry hordes, but soon will encounter the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Am Yisrael Chai. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. It began over 40 years ago with a call from the Lord to change the way the world worships. Now, as Yeshua prophesied, we find ourselves in the midst of wars and rumors of wars. And as a result, God has enlisted us to raise up an army to change the way the world worships. In these days, the Lord has revealed to us a Hebrew word that has become our new mandate, avodah. It means devotion in worship, work, and service. Here at Wilbur Ministries, we put that commission into action. How do we do that? We carry the presence of God to the nations, preaching and singing the word of the Lord. From mountain villages in Latin America, to stadiums in the Middle East, and everywhere in between. But 
but it's so much more than just the music. Shabbat shalom. Welcome to Shabbat in your home. It's about confronting the darkness in the media with our weekly broadcasts of Shabbat in your home and the Paul Wilbur and Friends and podcasts. Then we get into also the ministry elements. It's about bringing life to a forgotten African Jewish tribe by drilling freshwater wells. And it's about bringing much needed aid to the IDF and those on the front lines fighting for the survival of Israel. As you see on your TV screens and across social media, it is not only a spiritual war, but a physical one. It has never been more important to be doers of the word than it is today. When you partner with Wilbur Ministries, you are not only helping send the music out to the nations, but you are joining hands with the covenant people of God and those in need across the globe. The time to act is now. For Zion's sake, we will not keep silent. Partner with us. Help us to raise up an army to change the way the world worships. And to fulfill the words of Yeshua when he said, the Father was seeking those who would worship in spirit and in truth. Avodah. Become a part of our world partner family today. Go to wilburministries.com or scan the QR code on your screen. Oh, 